And this part we want um, to talk about modern teenagers, how they see this world and future in it, what challenges they face every day, how they overcome it. We've heard from Katrina, but we've got some other people to hear from, some adults um, and who have a lot to offer. And I have the great pleasure of introducing the moderator of this conversation about the generation of the future, my very dear friend, a one-time first lady herself of the United Kingdom, the chair and co-founder of the remarkable Their World charity, it's Sarah Brown. Sarah, the floor is yours. Keep pointing up. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks. Coming behind you. Thank you so much. Well, we're on this last session. Thank you to Stephen and Hanya and also to Katja for that wonderful conversation before. Now, our conversation is about that generation of the future and hearing from a number of speakers. We're going to focus on the concerns and challenges, but also the opportunities for the younger generation. So, allow me to invite the first participants to our conversation and to welcome the First Lady of Estonia, Syria Karis. Hello, my name is Syria Karis. I am the First Lady of Estonia. I was most shocked when reading the statistics of suicides and attempted suicides among young people in Estonia. Each individual story is terribly sad but statistics reveal the scale of the problem. This is why me and President Alar Karis have decided to make mental health of young people one of the central themes of the presidency. Taking care of mental health becomes especially relevant in crisis situations, supporting the Ukrainian refugees. Providing good mental health support is a part a solution to all the modern challenges. And here today with us also is the First Lady of Serbia, Tamara Vucic. Mental health is a current topic at any time and in every corner of the globe. Every day is a test. It's a struggle. Life is unpredictable, but the way we perceive challenges and how we tackle them is entirely up to us. It seems to me that everlasting love is the most important factor for overcoming all crises, including mental ones. With all due respect to modern medicine, with love, all other crisis-solving skills can succeed, but without it, none of them. And also a big welcome to the spouse of the Prime Minister of Armenia, Anna Akobayan. And it's with great pleasure that I invite the partner of the President of Slovakia, Juraj Rizman. My name is Juraj Rizman. I'm partner of Zuzana Čaputova, the President of the Slovak Republic. My mother is a psychologist, uh, so I grew up in the family where mental health was not a taboo. It's very important to speak about the mental health, especially now, after all those traumas from crisis. But to speak is not enough. We need to act. Slovakia faced several challenges in this area. On one hand, we managed to adopt uh, strategic documents, new policies, but on another hand, we are still lacking a lot of uh, mental health care therapists, for example. Good news is uh, that there is a lot of awareness through the young generation. They really take care about their mental health and they speak about it. That's something different from my generation. What we need to provide are the services for them. That's a challenge for Slovakia. And also with us, we have the psychologist Natalia Pidlisna and well-known Ukrainian stand-up comedian and volunteer Vasil Baidak.
welcome. Come and join us. And with great pleasure, I also present to you another participant of the conversation who will join us online, the Hollywood actor, public figure, and a good friend of Ukraine, Richard Gere. It tested earlier, and he was on. I was assured he was online. Here we go. There. Richard. There I am. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Hello, hello, hello. Greetings. I know that everyone is delighted to have you join this First Ladies and Gentlemen Summit here in Ukraine. Let me start by talking to you and let me, let's have you kick off this discussion. I'd like some thoughts on yourself as a teenager, but also really how you would advise young people thinking about the differences for them today, how you find common language with them as a parent, how we understand each other better. Well, first of all, I, I want to say the, uh, the kids you've had on this program are pretty amazing. <laughs> the intelligence and uh, the wit and the wisdom uh, that they're expressing is pretty extraordinary, especially in the situation they're in right now. Um, I have a, a son who's 23, and then I have younger kids who are 10, uh, 4, and 3. So I have some experience in this, uh, this world. Um, my own teenage years, uh, I think were uh, maybe typical of, of all teenagers of, of not quite knowing who I was and what I wanted, what my, my future path would be, my voyage through life. Um, there were a lot of insecurities. Uh, what I call at this point a dissonance from my experience of myself and my experience of the world and what I was told the world was and what I was told and habituated to thinking that the world was. Um, and that led to, I think, a lot of tension and confusion in my life. Um, you know, thankfully, it, it took me into a profession that I think helped me engage those feelings of um, isolation sometimes, uh, feeling very alienated and alone, um, which I came to realize was kind of the state we are all in, uh, and, and um, to some degree or another. And then I grew up as a teenager, I was in, in the 60s, uh, and that was the time of the Vietnam War and uh, very different from the European situation. The war wasn't in America. It was in Vietnam, very far away, different culture, uh, different language, um, different ways of seeing the universe. And I was uh, uh, very uh, much at jeopardy of being sent to that war. And uh, that, I think, was the, the overlying tension of men especially uh, of that time. Um, thankfully, I was able to, to have a profession, as I said, acting, making movies, first of all, was theater. Uh, that gave me a lot of focus and, and kind of insisted that I look at my own mental health, look at how my mind works, at how my emotions work. And also, it led me in my exploring uh, my own mind and the universe, uh, took me to Buddhism, which um, has uh, given me a very solid background of, of understanding myself and the universe, uh, but a path going towards a kind of freedom and openness uh, I think we all look for. Um, I'm, I'm often thinking of a, of a story that was told to me many years ago. It was about a grandfather and a grandson. And the grandfather was with his son, grandson. The grandson loved his grandfather very much and was always sitting on his lap and hugging and kissing. And at one point, the, the grandfather said, did you know, I, I don't think I ever told you, but I have two wolves living inside my heart. And one is very kind and very gentle and loving and very wise. And the other one is angry and causing trouble all the time and, and, uh, and, and uh, hates everyone. And, and uh, 
the two of them fighting constantly inside my heart. And the grandson said, well, which one is going to win? And the grand grandfather says, whichever one I feed. Thank you so much. And I think you're in a situation... Well, I just I want to take that a little further. I think you're in a situation there now where where one can can give in to the anger and the hatred of this horrendous moment in Ukrainian history that you're living through right now, and real pain in the real world. Um, but there's another way of looking at this that is um, the larger heart and the larger mind that can see things in a larger perspective. And for teenagers, and for all of us as adults also, to be aware that that larger absolute part of us, the absolute mind and heart, will always triumph over the relative. We have to keep identifying with it. Great. Thank you so much, Richard. We appreciate that contribution. Now, I'm mindful we've got to get everybody in, and this is at the end of a, a long session. But I want to hear from the expert psychologist here, Ms. Pilitza. Thinking about the earlier presented research results, did they surprise or confirm your expectations, particularly with regard to Ukrainian? And also highlighted within that were some of the digital challenges, and I wondered how you thought that affected teenagers today. Мене не здивувало зовсім. Мені здалось, що я це десь чула. Well, I think uh, um, I think we've heard it somewhere. We see this every day. We see how it uh, transpires every day, the way our children and our grandchildren feel. All this shows and backs up all those numbers. And those numbers show a lot of pain. Uh, children very often speak about shame when they need to ask for help. Sometimes children cannot ask for help. A lot of children, just like uh, adults, would like to ask for, for assistance, but they can't for one reason or another. So we can draft all kinds of programs and uh, so on and so forth, but unless and until we use the mass media and the social media and change the very attitude of people to mental health, to mental health professionals, this will get us nowhere. And no one will be seeking professional assistance. No one will be trying to save themselves. And in my opinion, this is something absolutely important. We all have to appreciate that and raise the very awareness about that. We need to make an overhaul in the very attitude to this problem. And this will impact the behavior of children, and they will be getting necessary services. And everyone should start with him or herself. Ms. Harris, I know that you and your husband have really prioritized mental health for people and made it one of the center of your activities, and that this happened after you were shocked by the statistics of suicide amongst young people. Um, this is a really difficult subject, but one that we can't ignore. Can you share with us how your state copes with that and addresses that and is meeting those challenges? Does it work? Yes. Yes, it does. First of all, I really like to say how brave and clever are our young people. We heard these uh, videos and there was a nice young girl. It is amazing. They are our future. But uh, as everybody already has talked quite a lot, quite a lot of problems, then anyway, I want to share with you some practices in Estonia, if you don't mind. A start is a little bit not easy for me. 
Torochi simi, torochi materi. Die Olena. Dear friends of Ukraine, children and young people are one of the most vulnerable segments of our population. Statistics underscore the fact that adolescents often grapple with mental well-being concerns more widely than any other group cohort. Some lifelong conditions have their roots in childhood experiences. Therefore, it becomes our solemn duty to provide the best support for our children to navigate the challenges they face. And doing so, possibly prevent future health issues. Are you hear me? Okay. <laughs> we need more action by governments and by civil society, but not single initiative is enough. Our strategy must be rooted in the establishment of an all-encompassing support system, meaning accessible help for everyone based on their needs. In Estonia, we are wholeheartedly committed to constructing such a system. It might be useful to think of those mental health services as a pyramid. At its top, we find professional assistance provided by psychiatrists and clinical psychologists suited for addressing severe cases. However, in order to prevent escalation of most issues to the level where such professional help is needed, it is imperative to foster services at the lower tiers of the pyramid, namely community level services and initiatives geared towards nurturing the psycho-emotional resili resili resilience of our people. This translates into an educational paradigm wherein children are equipped with the tools to navigate their emotions, recognize problems, and provide, provide support. The same holds true for parents and for educators. While it is tempting to blame internet and social media for the challenges our youth face, we must first look in the mirror and ask ourselves, have we really made our best to make our children feel safe and supported? Have we created an environment that nurtures their resilience for handling the complexities of both digital and real world scenarios? Let us all call for healthy relationships with friends and family, for more green spaces in cities, sports facilities, safe higher maintenance for spending time with friends, for widely accessible non-formal education and cultural institutions such as museums as well and libraries as well. All these play a pivotal, often overlooked role in supporting mental health being. Consequently, we must acknowledge that every facet of our police making must constantly be framed within the context 
of mental health. Every policy can and should be mental health policy. Thank you. So if I could move now uh, to our First Lady of Serbia, Mrs. Vucic. You raised before your concerns about dangers for teenagers on social networks and online. I wondered if you could talk a bit about what the Serbian government has been doing for, with the working group to support youth mental health and safety. Yeah, uh, if we are talking about social networks, I believe that everyone here uh, would agree that uh, they are really powerful means of communication that uh, raise uh, such a high standards that are uh, impossible to follow. And I believe we are living in a time that Warhol foresaw that every each of us uh, has that popularity and that glory for 15 minutes. And such state of the play is a challenge for a grown-up person, let alone for a child, uh, a young person who has not reached that point of maturity and self-confidence. Young people, they are suscept susceptible to influence. They are susceptible to manipulation, if you want. And I believe it's up to us to help them in a way to encourage them to work on themselves, to work on their education, to work uh, on building a critical opinion and critical thought in order to be able to run everything they hear, everything they um, read through a filter of their own virtues and their own values and emotions. We need to explain them that that bubble they're living in is not the real one and that they need to establish real contacts instead of online ones. Uh, if we don't do that, if we uh, fail, we will have uh, more generations, we already have them unfortunately, which are more depressed, uh, more fragile, more anxious and so on. So I believe we need to put some effort and to talk to them. Uh, in the first video that was uh, broadcasted here, uh, I said one word, word, and that's communication. I think that's the point. We need to communicate and to motivate them to open up, to speak about their emotions, about their problems, challenges they're facing, because adolescence is a period that every each of us went through. It happens in Belize. I, I had an uh, opportunity to participate at a conference there, speaking about adolescent per period, and I heard the same fears, the same challenges I heard in Serbia, in China, or here in Ukraine. So these are the same things, and they need to know that we all went through that, or their peers are going through that at this point in time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now, I'm going to turn to Baidak, who many of you will, may know is a well-known comedian, but also well-known for his volunteering. And what I'd like to ask you really is, what is it that you think modern teenagers are striving for and what they live by? And what place do these digital technologies occupy in the lives of teenagers to get that balance that we've been hearing between harm and benefit? <laughs> Uh, I apologize, I was just uh, listening. Uh, teenagers want peace, this is 100%. They want it, they want all this to come to an end. Uh, for me, it is a difficult situation when I often uh, communicate with uh, teenagers, with young people, and uh, when I see children who live in a terrible reality, and we understand how terrible it is, but for them it's a reality. And the most difficult thing is for, for me is to realize all this. Uh, about four times I cried uh, uh, during this uh, large-scale uh, uh, war. Uh, and uh, the last time I did it when I was watching this movie by Antonio. And the next time it was uh, when I was uh, riding in a train from Kiev to Vinica. I was coming back home and overheard 
uh, dialogue between a three or four year old boy and his mom, they were talking about terrible things. And he said, where are we going? And mom said, we're going far away. Why not at home? Not not going home, he said. And mom, the mom says, yes, we don't have any home. And he said, it was bang, bang. Yes, mom said. It was after bang, bang. So for him, it was a reality. And this is the most difficult thing for me to realize. Uh, uh, with regards to uh, young uh, people and teenagers. But the way they are holding on, the way they are joking, I very often hear jokes by teenagers, how they joke in uh, difficult situations, it's very inspiring. I'm a stand-up comedian, and I've been doing this for 10 years. At the beginning, I was in the genre of absurd, uh, grotesque, surrealistic, uh, something like Monty Python or Fred Lorio, uh, show Dovonosek in Ukrainian uh, context. When the uh, invasion began, I felt that I didn't want to be in other worlds. For me, it was absurd that you are just uh, pushing from the real world and then go fly to some grotesque, surrealistic world. But I realized that I wanted to stay in this reality and remain in this reality because humor, sometimes people say that humor is a weapon. No, I don't agree with this. And uh, because if there is a war, there is no other weapon than real weapons. But humor is armor, armor which help you to defend yourself, to pro it protects. It helps me mentally. It helps people who listen to me mentally. The first person who told me this was my father, because when the invasion uh, began, uh, we all were in a very terrible situation. But there were some funny moments, how cynical it may sound. I told my father that invasion starts he looked out the window and said, oh, and it is raining as well. So I just burst into love, and it was something very humorous. And uh, then I uh, performed for military. I performed at the front line, close to the front line. I performed for uh, people who are on rehabilitation in the occupied territories. When you see a person who is who laughs. Uh, I remember a woman laughing in village Yahidne. She was sitting on the empty box uh, of uh, Russian uh, munitions. Uh, and uh, after the village was liberated, we came there and they asked me to perform a stand up over there. I said, uh, I, I, I was afraid. I didn't know how could I perform because people after living through this uh, fear and pain, uh, how could they laugh? So we were sitting on the boxes uh, from Russian munitions. On the background, there were ruined uh, buildings, but people were laughing. Uh, so humor has uh, extreme power. And it was the third uh, difficult situation when I uh, talked to a, a girl who was under occupation sitting in the basement for more than 30 days. And she said, you know, I am even missing those times because we were all together over there in that basement. And you understand that this is a reality which should not be a reality. Everything should be done for this reality to be substituted with reality, which we see in good movies, fairy tales, songs. I can I can tell you lots of things. Just stop me. Uh, Just tell us where your next booking is, and everyone will come to that gig. <laughs> uh, in London. Come and see him in London. But thank you so much. Thank you thank for speaking you. Thank to you. us today. So I'd like to turn, turn my next question across to the First Lady of Armenia, Ms. Akabayan. In addition to being the First Lady, a public figure, a journalist, you're also the mother of four children. Um, this is juggling a lot, but thinking about your children and you know, the children of your country and beyond and here in Ukraine, 
What does a future hold for those, that younger generation? And what is it that the first ladies and gentlemen can do to help that next generation with their work? Dear moderator, thank you for a thought-provoking uh, question. First of all, I would like to welcome the initiative of the First Lady of Ukraine, Olena Zelenska, to hold this first summit of uh, First Ladies and Gentlemen. This is a very important platform to discuss our problems and maybe find solutions. As you said, uh, I am a mother of four children. Shushan is our third child. She is 16 years old and is a student of UWC. When, as, when I was preparing my answer, I asked her to share her vision regarding to this question as a common teenager. And this is Shushan's answer. I'm quoting. From a perspective of a nowadays teenager, myself, an Armenian female and an international student, I can describe the mental health mindset and life of today's teenagers this way. Today's teenagers are the generation that is really passionate about change, equality, justice, women rights and sustainability. They try to understand the world and create a better future for themselves. A factor that can make everything much harder or much easier for them are adults, parents, siblings, etc. And I believe the one thing that adults can do is helping teenagers understand some things and then making them feel free in their choices. In general, today's generation is definitely giving a bigger picture about the different future. And all they need is to have the opportunity to create something by their own patience, actions, and mindset." End of quote. Ladies and gentlemen, although Shushan is not mentioning big problems, but at the same time she is dreaming about different future. And it looks like that Shushan and her friends are not happy with the current situation of the world. I don't think that they appreciate the world we live in and are going to pass them. And to be sincere, they have, let's say, huge reason for that. We are returning from the exhibition Martyrology Children, where we commemorated the deceased children in Ukraine from February 24, 2020 until now. When I think about the question what the future holds for my children, children of my country and the children of the world, first of all, I think about those children who no longer have a future, who remained in the past and whose memory we have just commemorated. I think that we, the adults, did not do our utmost at the time so that the future would not prepare such an end of life for them. I feel extremely guilty for those kids. I feel very guilty for all the children of the world who were murdered in various wars, regardless of which country they were killed in, without distinction of race, color, religion, or social origin. It is not normal to have a Materiology Children exhibition in the 21st century. It is not normal to have children scared by bombing. It is not normal in the 21st century to have children trapped in a blockade, being hungry, exhausted, with a fear of genocide in their hearts. As we speak, 120,000 people, peaceful people in, of Nagorno-Karabakh are on the verge of humanitarian catastrophe to do, due to the an inhuman blockade of Lachin Corridor and subjected to constant life threats. 30,000 children living in Nagorno-Karabakh are struggling from malnutrition and lack of food. They are forced to stand in a queue for hours in order to get some minimum amount of food. They are witnesses frequently recorded cases of faintings because which is directly related to the overstressed mental state of the residents in Nagorno-Karabakh. 30,000 children are blocked in a small land, deprived from their inalienable rights, such as right to food, right to healthcare, right to education. 2,000 
pregnant women in Nagorno-Karabakh don't have even basic access to health care. Only a blockaded mind can turn the blind eye to the hardships of innocent people, and only a deadlocked heart keeps the blockade of the road of life, the Lechen Car Corridor, link Nagorno-Karabakh to Armenia and the external world. Coming to the end, I would like to call all of us to be enough brave to find the solutions to all our problems, including above mentioned, from completely other angel. We need to value every single woman life. And while all of us, or at least some of us, are busy with global political agendas and everyday routine, we need to find new ways and tools to stop the wars and value the human lives. At the end of the day, global peace is a fundamental condition for progress, and only in this regard we can inherit a better world for future generations. With all within our minds, Armenia, with Women Political Leaders Global Network, is organizing a summit dedicated to the role of women leaders to promoting democracy, peace, and security in 19th, 20 October in 2023 in Yerevan. Can I thank you for your contribution? And we'll learn more about that next summit beyond the support of this meeting. But Thank you so much. Okay, I just wanted to invite all these distinguished uh, women absolutely. to Yerevan on October later. to discuss the That's topic. Fantastic. Very important. Thank you so thank much. Thank you, and thank, thank you, you for your very somber reflections which give us pause for thought. Now I'm going to move on to our final contributor, who is the uh, partner of the President of Slovakia, Mr. Rizman. Um, Talking to you, I want to ask you questions about the generational differences of how you think this current generation of teenagers differs from previous ones, and particularly in their attitudes towards mental health and their response to the challenges. Thank you for the question. First of all, I think we know it all that always the older generation, us over 45 years, we are always complaining about the young generation. Uh, and I hear it quite often. I hear it quite often that the uh, young generation is soft, weak, etc., etc. And here I would like to be the advocate of the young generation. I grew up in the communism, in communistic Czechoslovakia. Uh, I remember how the system broke down, how we had the um, uh, wild 90s in the post-Soviet, post-socialist country. Uh, transformation, economical crisis, very hard situation, how we fight the autocratic prime minister. But still, is it that we are stronger than the generation now? I don't think so. If I look, if I see that what young generation is going through, if we speak about COVID crisis, two years, no schools or online schools, very complicated period of time, how they overcome it. If we speak that after the COVID, uh, that, that was the war in Ukraine, which came yeah. to more or less not only the Ukraine, but also to our countries, how it affects our young generation. No. If we, if we speak about the other crisis, economical crisis, financial crisis, the young generation is seeing that through the parents, through their families, through their communities, etc., etc. I would say that this is a strong generation. I would say that if we are speaking about my generation or all the generation as a strong ones, and this about the weak one, it is not fit. It's uh, not true. Because I am saying that if we would go over all these crises like COVID, like the war, like the economic crisis, we would not manage better. So I would like to advocate uh, for, the, for the young generation here. And if we compare the generations, there is something which I am very happy yeah. about the young generation. In, for my generation, to speak about the mental health, that was a taboo. In the communist country, like once you open the, the mental health issue in the basic school, secondary school, high school, universities, that was the end. Like nobody was speaking about that. For the younger generation, I am very happy to see all the numbers which were presented today that this is not taboo anymore. We still, there is still a challenge. There is still the number of people which, which need to be uh, um, helped and, and, and motivated to contact the professional, to openly speak about the mental health. But uh, all the numbers shown today 
are showing us that the young generation is taking the mental health as a part of the overall health care, which is a new. It's not a taboo anymore, and I'm very happy about that. And the second, second uh, part of your question, that was the question how we are able to help them, mm -hmm. how we are able to help the young generation. And, uh, well, of course, we are able to speak about all these systematic changes which we need to see. And I think there were more professionals which were speaking about that before me. So, of course, we need more preventive work. Of course, we need way much more uh, professional therapeutics. Of course, we need, we all know, even if we doubled, tripled, on, or, or even more, the number of the therapeutists, it will not help us uh, to face the real uh, scale of our situation. So, so, of course, we know that we need to involve our communities uh, to, to help with, uh, with the mental health uh, services. Uh, of course, we, all those things we know. But I would like to focus on something, something maybe, maybe easier. As a parent, as a, as a father of the teenager, uh, I would like to highlight something which was also presented through the statistics, but is much more human, because we know that what we need to do on the systematic, legislative, political level, et cetera, et cetera. But as a people, as a, as a parent, I really believe that we need to take more time, we need to take more time with contact with our children, with, with the young generation. What we are able to give them is uh, our focus, our time, our, our energy, our interest. And very easy steps which we are able to do, which I try to do with my son, not always successfully, but yeah, well, I, I try my best, is listen to them, um, ask them what they are thinking about, what worries them, um, Let's try to find together the solutions with them. Very often, they only need to be heard. They only want to express, which is very important first steps, if we speak about the mental health, to, to ventilate all the pressure they have inside. It means you have to notice the problem, problems as well. Notice. Yeah. And then you, uh, they will talk to you about the problems. Really, they don't want to do that. Yeah, but my experience is that, that, come on, I am really trying to ask a lot of things, even more than he is asking me. And, and sometimes it's opening the stuff, and after several days he comes back, and he is going back to the question I had a few, few days ago, and the ventilation is a first good start. And, and I think what is a problem, or symptom of the problem of today, is that we don't have a time to spend together in the families, in the communities. So what I am advocating for is to really focusly think about to creating the safe space to discuss with, with our beloved one, mostly the young generation. Thank you maybe so much. We have, uh, maybe we have some time to talk to, to the teachers and trainers and art teachers and music teachers. They sure. are spending with our children quite a lot of time, and maybe we don't notice. They do. Isn't they do, and, and we need to do uh, more. Uh, that's, that's what I believe. You're both agreeing with each other there. <laughs> if yeah. I may add something. Can, what I'm going to do is turn it to the video where we've got some recordings from, from first ladies and gentlemen who we haven't been able to hear from and to hear what they have to contribute. Modern teenagers have already been through a lot in their young age. Today's teenagers have experienced the COVID-19 pandemic. They are either experiencing war themselves or war is ravaging the countries of their peers. According to this UNICEF survey, one third adolescents surveyed reported having symptoms of depression. 42% of adolescents reported experiencing moderate to severe anxiety symptoms. And half the world's population lives in countries where there is just one psychiatrist to some 200,000 or more people. What I personally believe, mostly from the perspective of a mother with children of different ages, is that mental health is something that we need to touch in the framework of our educational systems 
at home and in school. Outside of the schools, we have a program called Planet Youth, which focuses on adolescent substance abuse prevention. In Iceland, that involves mobilizing the local community to increase the likelihood that young people will use their free time in a positive, constructive way. I have been part of numerous activities aimed at raising awareness about mental health, especially among young people, and breaking the stigma associated with it. As a parent, I know full well how important physical health is, and I take that very seriously as far as my daughters are concerned. But let's also not forget their mental health. And I start with this, and I want my girls to feel free to come to, to, to me, to others they trust, to talk about their mental health challenges if they arise, but equally to ask for help. Everyone in my family has been affected in one way or another. My youngest son has had a hard time socializing with friends face to face. We make them understand that it's okay to be sad, anxious, or even depressed, but they need to talk about it and ask for help. También es una generación altamente preparada para asumir los retos que el futuro ya nos está planteando. Por ejemplo, nunca antes hubo tanta conciencia ecológica para frenar el cambio climático o una lucha tan potente por la igualdad entre hombres y mujeres. El mundo es otro y su juventud también. It's our responsibility to do everything we can to support young people to unleash their full potential, to harness the power of our youth diversity, to empower them with knowledge and skills to make informed decisions. Great, and our video is going to take us back to Richard Gere and just to have his thoughts on what he's hearing about some of the solutions and ways that we can uh, look after our teenagers better. Um, well, I'm just kind of blown away with the intelligence and the warmth and wisdom of everyone participating there, but also looking at the faces of the people there witnessing this. Um, the humanity in the space of this symposium is pretty extraordinary. I mean, what I think what this all comes down to is empowering our kids to express themselves and having the courage ourselves to look at our own minds, which I pray for every day, but to encourage our kids, give them the language and the habit of expressing themselves, their deepest feelings. Um, and that really comes from genuinely listening. Listen, listen, listen. Uh, with that space and generosity of, of listening, adults open up and kids open up. Um, and that's what we're talking about here. It's, it's, it's a very challenging world that our kids are in. And they need to talk to us about it. And our job is to help them find their way through that jungle of emotions that they are experiencing at this point. I also want to bring up one thing. My brother is working with a group in Ukraine, which is doing extraordinary work. Teenergizer is the name of this group. It's a youth-led Ukrainian non-governmental organization that uh, empowering young people to protect their health and exercise their human rights. Their current focus is providing psychosocial support for Ukrainian adolescents affected by this horrendous invasion and occupation. Um, they have over 200 trained psychologists uh, that provide help for youth and kids of all ages. So I would suggest you look at their website. And thank you for allowing me to be part of this extraordinary event. Hopefully this is not something that only happens once a year, but it's continuous that we are part of a universal education where we realize we're all on this little planet together floating through an infinite universe, and we need each other desperately. 
Richard, thank you so much for joining us here today at the summit. And thank you to all of our panelists. And a big thank you to Madam Elena Zelenska for convening us all here today. Um, I think that we realize that First Ladies and Gentlemen are the new su superpower. Thank you. We'll let Stephen and Hannah come back up. Bravo. Well, bravo. Bravo to all our wonderful contributors, the comic and the serio comic and all of you. Uh, that was a wonderful session, a really tremendous session, and it made me feel how very sad I am that when I was an adolescent 320 years ago, I didn't have people like this fighting my corner. But never mind. Hannah. А ми тим часом... In the meantime, we have one more address um, uh, from uh, Her Royal Highness Mette Marit, Her Royal Highness Crown Princess of Norway. First Lady Olena Zelenska, Excellencies, Ukrainian friends. How do we carry ourselves and each other through extreme situations? I believe this question touches the core when we address mental health in times of war. The full implications of Russia's war of aggression, above all for the children, women and men of Ukraine, are impossible to fathom. I would like to commend the Ukrainian people for your resolve and resilience over the past year and a half. You're truly an inspiration to us all. Thank you for inviting me to speak at this event, to raise awareness for the, of the impact of war on mental health. To address this issue is a part of any effort to achieve sustainable peace. Conflict-related violence affects everyone, men and women, girls and boys, people losing loved ones, families being torn apart and homes destroyed. One in every six children globally is growing up in a conflict zone. This is a severe burden on their mental well-being and seriously affects their future. It affects individuals and it affects whole societies. I think First Lady Zelenska described the scope of this issue very well in her address at the NATO meeting in Vilnius in June, promoting this summit. We will talk about psychological recovery for every country and person. After all, mental health has no borders. Over the past year and a half, I have had the opportunity to learn firsthand from Ukrainian families in Norway about the particular burden of being a refugee from war. The lack of information, the constant worrying, the powerlessness and the feeling of guilt for not being there. The complexity of this trauma is a heavy burden to carry over a long period of time and I am amazed to see how people are still capable of finding the strength and the courage to live their everyday lives carried by the hope and by the community of friends and supporters. We need to form international partnerships to support Ukraine, not only military and materially, but also when it comes to health-related issues. One part of this effort is the five-year Nansen support program for Ukraine. Significant parts of this support is channeled through projects to restore and improve access to essential mental health and rehabilitation services. Access to mental health services and psychosocial support strengthen people's resilience and help rebuild their lives after conflict. Because those days will come, days of peace and normal life. And when they do, Ukraine will need its people to find the strength and the motivation to restore their lives, their communities, their country. In the meantime, we will do what we can to carry each other and Norway will take continuous support for Ukraine for as long as it takes. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that was an incredible day and uh, filled uh, with uh, humanity and kindness. We were all together. We cried together, laughed together, got inspired and learned together. 
but the most important that we learned to be happy under any circumstances and despite all everything to remain human. Дякую всім, хто взяв участь звичайно особ. Extraordinary and inspired creation that I hope will become a regular, a regular institution that the world will continue to respect. And it's a reminder that Ukraine is not just in search and of keeping the territory that it belongs to you in terms of land, but the territory that belongs to you in terms of humanity, open thinking, free thought free exchange and the beauty that that inspires. You are admired around the world and this occasion is one example of why. So thank you all for doing that. We want to end this evening with a few lines that were born at the break of this stormy summer. Hannah, will you help? Uh, yes, Stephen, of course, such words aim at the very heart and hit it. It will be so good there for us, wherever we will be. No matter how hard life will hit, if already given, so it's time to win.